Today we answer viewer questions about car buying, reliability, and towing, discuss car-related Super Bowl ads, and we give you our first impressions of our 2018 Ford EcoSport, next on Talking Cars. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm John Lincove. I'm Gabe Schenauer. Well, so keen-eyed viewers will note that we're in our, what, Studio B location, I guess we'll call it, because we've been having some weather situations here in Connecticut. Cold winter. Uh, yes, uh, and snow and ice, and so all of our spare test cars are in our normal garage where we, where, where we usually film. Mm -hmm. So today we're over here. Um, it's, it's cozy. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, viewer questions today. You know, we asked you guys to send us 30-second videos uh, with questions and comments to us. And so they put in the work making these videos. We, uh, they've started to flow in. So we're going to take the time to answer those questions. So uh, our first video uh, is about a guy who's trying to buy his, uh, his dad a car. So uh, let's play that clip. Hey, Consumer Reports. I'm helping my dad shop for a new car. He currently really likes his 2008 Subaru Forester. It's the base model with a stick shift. He's starting to get a little older, and he's really interested in these new cars because of their safety features. He really thought he wanted a Subaru Crosstrek or maybe a Toyota Camry. I'm wondering if a better pick might be a Impreza wagon or a Mazda 3 wagon. That gives him some of the utility that he's used to with his Forester while providing a better ride, better fuel economy, and of course what we're really after here is those new safety features. Thanks for the help. Okay, so Charles uh, is trying to buy his dad uh, a new car. He previously had a Forester. Um, John, what do you think, uh, what, what's your suggestion for, for Chuck? I think Chuck uh, deserves a spot in the panel, first of all. Okay. Uh, it's a good video. Um, look, I, I would go first and foremost with the advice of not forcing your feelings onto somebody else. Um, it almost is like the big old joke about like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a small SUV. What should you get? Well, you should get a BMW uh, E30 M3 because that's the best car ever. You know, that's an internet joke. But it, it's so much like, I like this. You should get it. So, you know, if he's looking for a Camry, he's looking for a Crosstrek. Crosstrek and the Impreza wagon, definitely similar vehicles. The Subaru Impreza wagon, right. Subaru Crosstrek. Um, you know, but maybe he likes the fact that the Crosstrek's a little, uh, has a little more of, of a easier access because it's not as low. It sits up a little higher. You know, right. so it has all the advantages of the Impreza wagon, but that little that ease of access might be a little bit a little better for his dad. Um, I would definitely say if you're in a Forester, I would go with the Subaru versus jumping into a Camry. It's a whole different experience. Nothing wrong with the Camry, great fuel right. economy, reliability, but it's almost in a don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. Right. I mean, uh, he didn't say actually why he doesn't want a Forester again, which is would be an option. Maybe he wants to go a little smaller, but you know he. Charles said a couple things. He said he, you know, he's looking for a better ride and fuel economy. But a couple of the things that he mentions, you know, if you go with a Mazda 3, you're probably not getting a better ride. Uh, so I don't know if that's, and he also wants safety features. Safety features are very key. And by that, I assume he's talking about automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning. So do you have a take on that, Gabe? If he's really looking for fuel economy, a better ride, still versatility of a hatchback, which kind of ruins out uh, the Camry. Uh, what would you say? Yeah, I, I'd second John with the Subaru Crosstrek. I mean, it has an amazing ride comfort. Uh, it rides, it outrides some luxury cars even. And uh, it's, uh, you have uh, your sitting positions a little higher, so that uh, eases uh, access. And uh, I mean, you've got the versatility of a hatch. Uh, rear three-quarter visibility isn't as great as in the Forester, so that might be a factor. So um, I don't know what what's the reasons of uh, being unhappy with a Forester, but... Maybe he just wants something different. You know, sometimes people just, they maybe. want a new car, they just yeah, want something it, different. Yeah, it, I it, mean, it's going to be, even if he gets a new Forester, it's going to be a different true. than what he has now because he has a manual now. And if he wants the safety features, then make sure you get the EyeSight option, which is a package that brings you uh, automatic emergency braking and and uh, lane departure and uh, blind spot detection. Right. So well, all of these things are going to be I like that you brought up EyeSight, the safety features, and a manual transmission because with the Subaru, you can't get that. If you want uh, the, the uh, Crosstrek or the Impreza and you want the EyeSight, you can't get the, the manual transmission. Yeah. Both of those cars, you can get manual transmissions with them, but not with the EyeSight, which is interesting. Now, of course, the Camry, that stuff comes standard. Without the manual. Uh, with no manual at all right, right, right. and no hatchback. But that brings up the Mazda 3, because now for, for 2018, now automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning are standard, and 
the manual transmission comes standard, yep. so you're not paying extra for the CVT or an automatic. And uh, so you, you actually could get the Mazda 3 cheaper if you wanted the manual than those other cars. It, and, it, and that kind of comes back to the initial point I was making in the sense of it sounds like he wants, he likes a sporty car. And the Mazda right, 3 is certainly right. sporty. It's like, so you're saying Chuck wants a sporty car. Chuck wants it. His dad it. may not want the sporty car. We, well, we don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it's just a different vehicle. It's, it's, it's this, probably the snuggest of the three. Right. It's the sportiest. It's the more cockpity of the three. So uh, visibility is going to be compromised compared to the Forester, like Gabe talked right. about with, with the uh, the Crosstrek, but I probably like even the, more I like, so. I like the adjective cockpity. Yes, yeah. cockpity. Um, it's a new word. We started that here today. Right. Um, it'll it'll give you fuel economy. It'll give you a sporty sporty handling. It'll give you a right. sporty ride too, in a sense. So it'll be probably a little little stiffer. Um, I would say that that's the that that would be ranked with the Camry. Right. Uh, if you're just against the Crosstrek, fine, those are options. Right. But I would just say if he if he likes the Crosstrek, I case closed. I got to be honest. When I looked at that, I, I thought about it for a little bit, and I said to me, he sounds like a Crosstrek guy. It really does to me. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, let's move on to another another uh, question. Uh, we have another uh, clip from uh, a guy who is uh, was thinking about a Mazda CX-9, and and he had some issues with uh, reliability. So uh, let's play that clip. Hello, Consumer Reports. This is Peter from Irvine, California, and I have a question for you about the Mazda CX-9. Uh, this car was on our shortlist for a new vehicle until we saw the bad reliability ratings that came through, and I wanted to get more details on that to find out uh, what areas it afflicted and whether these are things that might be cured or worked on uh, through the 2017-2018 model releases, uh, whether Mazda has told you if they recognize those issues and uh, have improvements in store. Appreciate the help and thanks. Okay, so the issue here is, you know, he wanted a CX-9, but he knows that uh, the reliability that we publish, you know, uh, is, is not great for the CX-9. So he has a couple questions, Gabe. He's wondering, you know, one, do the manufacturers talk to us and say, you know, uh, that they're working on the reliability when they see these, uh, see our, reli our published reliability ratings? And um, are they, do we know if they're working on this? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, sure, we have a dialogue with manufacturers uh, on various levels. Uh, with the CX-9, you have to remember, we only have uh, data for one year, and there, there have been some uh, problems with the infotainment system. So, when you uh, statistically, when you compare, you know, even uh, some problems with uh, even one area of problems, it'll it'll show less than average reliability because for new cars, I mean, it's it's pretty much perfect across the board. Uh, so uh, knowing Mazda, I think uh, it would be safe to assume they're working on it. But we'll know for sure only when we get another year of reliability data, and uh, we'll know that only in the, in the fall. But right. Other than that, uh, CX-9 uh, tested very well in our uh, road test, right. and it's a very nice car to drive. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is it, it's kind of a little bit of a bummer because you know we bought a CX-9, we tested it. It was I really enjoyed driving mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, what Gabe is saying is that the reliability data we published is based on its first year of the redesign, which is sure. 2016 our predicted reliability for 2018, because it's based on that data, uh, makes it actually the, it's rated as the least reliable new mid-sized SUV you can buy according to our predicted certainly, reliability. Certainly. So knowing that, what would you, John, what would you tell this guy? Uh, you know, wait another year or buy something else entirely? Or buy it and take your chances? I, I, would, I would say, Look, if you really you're looking for a sporty SUV, I would take a leap with that vehicle, given that it's been churning through production for a while now. Right. Now, obviously, we're going we're waiting we wait till we get the data in from our from our annual survey. Um, the, like Gabe talked about, it's hurt because a brand new car should have no problems, you know. So then to have problems, you're really it's it's going to it's going to uh, with, with, the fr with the frequency of issues that they had, it, it really stood out. You know, there's even engine problems with, en you know, engine minor, engine major. Right, and engine minor, engine major, and infotainment right. and were infotainment. the issues. But the, the biggest issue was infotainment. And it's not like, right, there's not like there's huge engine issues. Right. But to have even a small amount of engine issues is, brings is it down to, right. to an above average uh, score versus well above average as far as, as being good. So it's, it's above average. Um, that said... I think that it it also suffers just from initial build type of issue. You right. know, anytime you're building something as complex as a car, 
you're, you're going to have to sort out some of the headaches. So That's short not, answer, I yeah. would say, I would go with the Mazda. Um, we didn't get a ton of verbatim saying like all these major issues with the right. engine. The infotainment system, so often we see it's a flash, it's an update. It, it's no longer the days of, oh, transmission problems. Stay away because they're going to have to rebuild right. that, that darn thing. Right. Um, so I would go with that because what's the alternative in that kind of sporty, nearish luxury one? You're going with the Highlander, you're going to go with the Pilot, two you know, very sporty. different vehicles. Yeah. Um, that, that's my personal opinion. Of course, it's not my money. And right. I could be taking that CX-9 to the dealer if it's a problem. Right. But advice-wise, I would say that you know, this, this long Maybe since it's been out, it's, it's probably good yeah. to take a chance. Yeah. That's yeah, my, it's, it's, my opinion, however. Yeah. It's not uncommon to have some teething problems for brand new cars that were just redesigned from the ground up. Right, right. Okay, uh, we've got one more question, so uh, let's take a look at that. Hey, Talking Cars crew, it's Mike. Love the show. My question for you today is, whatever happened with towing capacities for cars? It seems like years ago, almost every family car would have a nominal tow rating of 1,000 or 1,500 pounds, which would be convenient for a lot of utility purposes without needing to get a, a truck or something else. We've been making do ourselves with our uh, 2008 Outback here, and it's got a generous tow capacity of 2,700 pounds, even with its uh, base four-cylinder non-turbo engine. And it's been uh, more than enough to get us going with our uh, 5x8 utility trailer. Uh, but it seems like uh, as time goes on, almost every new car that's not a truck or SUV has got a not recommended tow rating, which seems like it would have implications for warranty purposes. And on top of that, it seems like uh, a lot of the same cars in Europe have a totally different tow cap capacity. So what gives? Is it lawyers, SUVs? Let me know. Thanks. Gabe, he's, he's is wondering about towing, you know, and, and you know, is... Is there less towing capacity these days on family cars? Um, are, you know, some are, don't have any towing capacity. What's going on with towing, Gabe? Uh, so uh, first, hi, Mike. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, in the old days, uh, I mean, there used to be like Ford Crown Vicks and, and whatnot, large uh, sedans, uh, body on frame, rear wheel drive cars that could tow. Uh, now those cars disappeared and, and we have uh, midsize uh, family cars like a uh, Toyota Camry, Honda Accord, uh, that, uh, of course, uh, would tow less. So you see uh, a much reduced uh, towing capacity or not even uh, recommended at all for sedans. Um, there are uh, some, uh, I mean, towing requires a heavy-duty cooling system, and that adds weight, and uh, there are different standards. Uh, I mean, in Europe, for instance, uh, you can see uh, some regular cars towing. Uh, I mean, of course, the boats are much smaller and the, the campers are much smaller. You don't see like a 22-foot Airstream right. uh, very very often. Um, also, um, there, there are some cars that might look the same here and in Europe, but right. they may have different tires and different brakes and different engines. And if a diesel engine is... Uh, um, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're talking about then uh, those have more torque and can tow more. So um, there are differences that are you know that stem from you know a multitude of factors right I, I have noticed in europe though i mean we've all been fortunate to go to europe a few times and i have noticed some pretty small cars towing pretty good sized uh camper trailers and so there there is a little bit of difference uh in requirements over in europe versus over here and i talked to our one of our auto analysts mel Yu, and he said that uh over here we follow sae j2807 you guys will want to look that up because that's some intriguing reading right there the society of automotive engineers yeah. oh yeah right, yeah right right and so the differences are there's different tongue weight requirements uh trailer brake requirements and the speed limits over there, you're not allowed to drive more than 60 miles an hour with a trailer over there, whereas here it varies from state to state. Mm -hmm. I will say in California, I learned uh, the hard way that it's only 55 miles an hour towing a trailer. So it, it varies. Yep. But so that there are some differences. Um, and, you know, it looks like these days, if you're going to tow, you're probably going to be getting an SUV or, or a pickup. Well, I, th I think that's the case is that in the old days... You know, the vestigial leftover vehicles that, that kept on because someone had invested in having towing equipment in their Crown Vic, in their giant Buick, in their, you know, whatever vehicle they had, you know, they were going to continue doing it. Right. But they stopped building those body on frame cars. They stopped building, you know, uh, they didn't care about weight as much. You know, fuel economy wasn't the same as today and creature comforts weren't the same. And now, you know, more, which means more weight and safety equipment means more weight. And the whole market has shifted. Yeah. People don't want those. I mean, look, you can't sell an Impala, you can't sell, you know, Avalon sells a lot and it's not even a huge seller. You know, these right. big sedans don't sell the same way they did because of SUVs. Right. And even because of pickup trucks, which are more family friendly and more livable. Um, 
it's it's just different. People don't want that. SUVs are taking over. It's just the market. Yeah. The market is dictated. The market has said, I don't care. Right. And so, uh, you guys keep uh, and gals uh, keep sending in those videos. Uh, a thirty second video with a question for us to consumerreports.org slash talking cars, and uh, hopefully we'll play one of yours. Um, next up. Uh, last Sunday uh, was Super Bowl 52. I think a good portion of us were sitting around uh, eating nachos and pizza and, and watching the Philadelphia Eagles beat my beloved New England Patriots. Oh, um, I, I, they're not really beloved, but they are my team. Okay. Well, it, <laughs> you know, my Giants were good. Yeah, they weren't e- And the Eagles yeah. won, and it's yeah. just, it was a bad day. Um, so, you know, obviously, uh, besides eating and drinking, you know, maybe watching some football, and of course, there's ads. You know, uh, they spend a lot of money on these ads. And we take particular interest in the car ones because we're car people. So a couple stood out for us. I wanted to discuss those with you guys. Just see what you thought about these ads. Uh, The first one I wanted to start with was there was a a 2018 Jeep Wrangler ad. Making claims to some overarching... You know, they called it the anti-manifesto. And this is where this Jeep goes uh, plowing through this river, uh, like bashing through the river and then up over this rock pile and getting all crazy and and driving in a not normally typical off-road fashion. They did say, disclaimer says, uh, closed man-made lake and waterfall. But Gabe, tell us what's silly about this ad. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's uh, totally silly uh, because uh, uh, what you're conveying through this ad is that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, buy a Wrangler and uh, you get a license to, uh, Trump through uh, whatever nature reserve you find, uh, kill how many uh, salmons you want uh, swimming in that river and destroying some uh, whatever uh, ecosystems uh, there are. So uh, I think it uh, borderlines on uh, irresponsible. But they covered themselves because they said mm-hmm. man-made. So yeah. I, I remember watching it, and before we even knew what was going to be on there, like, Man, that thing's tearing across it there. It was really going fast. I want to know what the Jeep looks like after it climbed that wall, well, if it, what was falling off it, because yeah. it assaulted that little wall. Not only that, really quickly. I, you it's listen, all fantasy land. you listen yeah. closely when it goes bashing into that river, yep. you can actually hear it smash into something really hard. It, uh, I played the video a couple times, I'll be honest it, with you. It, it looks very cool. The it Jeep looks is, super cool. The Jeep is not, extremely that is, capable. That but, is not what we would consider proper off-road well, I don't think that's what I know. Off, off-road, they teach you to drive nice and slow and right. be careful. And you know when it's going up the wall, it looks like potentially tip over backwards. I would say, you know, and it's not a CR thing, it's just in general. It, yeah. It's a general That's not how you drive road. off-road. Right, yeah. I mean, we'd, we've done stuff with, with Land Rover. You go to some press types of events, the uh, International Motor Press Association has Land Rover come and they build courses and the whole thing is the guy sitting in the right seat going, okay, now slowly, okay, modulate the throttle, right, okay, right, go right, easy. Right. Now, yes, it's a bunch of people who aren't off-road experts, right. but yes, you don't bound into things right. for, to be under control because that's when you right. lose control. No question, the old Wrangler, Super capable. Yep. This new Wrangler unquestionably will be super capable. And of course, we bought one. We have a 2018 Wrangler. We're putting yep. miles on it right now. So right. Uh, we won't be driving it quite like that, but we will have uh, full test numbers soon. Yep. Um, and we'll take it on our Rock Hill. Exactly. And At probably 65 not quite miles as fast. an hour. <laughs> um, we'll be a little more careful. Uh, another ad that was interesting was uh, the Kia Stinger, which another vehicle we also uh, recently bought. Actually, it's in our test program right now. Mm-hmm. So it's a 2018 Kia Stinger. And this ad uh, had Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, and the theme here was uh, Feel Something Again. And here he goes, uh, he gets in this car, and he goes reversing really fast backwards, then does a J-turn, this J-turn spin, and then he ends up being like uh, back in time. Uh, John, I have a couple questions for you. Mm. Okay. Uh, I mean, a cool ad in some ways, for sure. But uh, what is the point of this ad? I have did no it, idea. Did it do anything for you? What were you doing at that exact moment when you watched the ad? And why didn't you invite me to your Super Bowl party? You know, I have feelings. Um, let's take those in reverse. Okay, I didn't have a Super Bowl party, though I did ask you uh, what you were doing. Okay. Um, but you said you were busy with your family. Whatever. And given the events, okay. I think it was good that you were... I would have been strangling you. Would you like me to leave you guys alone here? <laughs> no, we're having a moment. I, you know, good in your misery, in your own time. Um... Did the ad do anything for me? No. Um, It's the same as when they pulled the Rolling Stones or Aerosmith and such out for the Super Bowl halftime show. I enjoy the music. Yeah. It's not selling me the car. And I don't understand what the demographic is for Kia to have Steven Tyler in there. Are they really going for people who are really old? Who, who, 
you know, starred in um, yeah, Days and Confused. You know, I mean, right. you know, heyday of Aerosmith type type of right. of, of, of era. Um, I, I don't know. So right. it's confusing to me. Now, Gabe, I mean, I think the number one question people are going to ask uh, us from that ad is, are we going to institute a J turn or what is really actually called the Rockford turn because that's what James Garner did in the Rockford Files, which was the single best private investigator show created in the history of television. So, Gabe, no, are we going to institute the Rockford turn into our testing here at Consumer Reports? Um, let me say, dream on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, good one. <laughs> good one. Um, but uh, yeah, I was uh, actually I only saw the the, the end, the very end of that ad because I was too busy uh, dipping my chip in the guacamole. But okay. uh, and then I saw Steven Tyler all of a sudden young again, and uh, so I, I thought it was a cool ad. Yeah, yeah, it's so, like a feel good kind of ad. So you missed Emerson yeah. Fittipaldi because he was on there for like two seconds, and I didn't understand why they had Emerson Fittipaldi for two seconds and then never did anything with him again. I mean, this is a former Formula One world champion, yep. former kart champion, which is now called the IndyCar Series, uh, Indianapolis 500 winner. And, I mean, look him up if you guys don't know who he is. Uh, very fa- One of the best yeah. racers of Top all track. time. And they had him for a sec- two seconds, and then he was gone. I didn't understand the point of that he, at all. He may so. not have either. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's just some he's, good money made. Yeah, he made some cash. Um, okay. So let's move on to uh, At the Track. And uh, this week, we, uh, we're going to talk about the 2018 Ford EcoSport, which we uh, just bought, and we're putting miles on it right now. Now, this is a subcompact SUV. It competes with Honda HRV, Mazda CX-3, uh, Nissan Rogue Sport, uh, Chevrolet Trax. Uh, and while the EcoSport is brand new to, to our market, it's, it's not that actually new at all. It's been around in other markets for a long time, Gabe. So tell us a little about, about this vehicle where, and where it comes from. Yeah, it's been around uh, particularly in developing markets uh, like in India and South America and uh, <clears throat> whatnot. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on the Ford Fiesta. Um, so um, Ford decided, um, hey, everybody is jumping on the bandwagon of uh, tiny SUVs. Uh, we have to have one too. And uh, let's look at our portfolio. Oh, we have this one. Uh, the Fiesta doesn't sell. So uh, here is something that we morphed into an SUV that uh, we can sell and can charge more money for. So yeah, it uh, wasn't really originally designed for the U.S. market. Um, is that a problem? And, uh, Do you see that as a problem? Uh, not necessarily, but uh, I mean, it took Ford some time to adapt the car for the U.S. market. It took them some time to get get rid of the uh, rear-mounted uh, spare tire, and uh, that explains the side-swinging uh, rear hatch, Yeah, uh, which is kind of unusual. Uh, but um, anyway, we've yeah. been driving it, and uh, I mean, although it looks kind of goofy, I mean, the proportions are all kind of funny, narrow, tall, tiny wheels, uh, so... But um, I'll say that it actually drives better than it looks. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to more of that in a second. Uh, the goofy part, though, I, I couldn't get past the goofy part because it, it, uh, it just looks kind of funny. It's got really uh, a lot of space between the wheel wells. And when I first looked at it, I'm like, what is that, a 15-inch wheels on it? No, <laughs> yeah. they're 17s. It's just yeah, got 12. all this. 12 inch. Yeah, it's got all this wheel well space. So it definitely looks a little, a little goofy. But... Uh, I will agree with you. It, it drives better than it looks in a sense. But so let's just talk about what it has. It has a one liter three cylinder turbo with front wheel drive. Right. And then uh, our version, which is all wheel drive, the all wheel drive versions come with. Uh, so that has 123 horsepower. The two liter all wheel drive versions have 166 horsepower. And that's what we have. You know, is it uh, this that amount of power, at least 166 166 horsepower is, you know, about what cars in this class have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you think about, uh, was that enough power? Is that just typical for the class or what? I think it's adequate for the vehicle. Um, this, the gearbox felt a little slow on some shifts. Um, I don't know if it's that it's just so tuned for fuel economy that it tries to send it up yeah. as, as high as possible. It, it's a fine vehicle. It's unremarkable. Yeah. It, I'll say this. Um, kudos to Ford in the sense that they keep a lot of their interiors very similar. Right. Unfortunately, I find that a lot of their interiors are very cramped and narrow. It's it's cons- throughout the line. I, I personally just find there it's it's again cockpitty, if you will, but um, d- they they don't fit well. They, they they have their. It's almost as if you see their their other their their non U.S. focus and they're sharing world cars and these world cars are just different. Uh, you know, it's 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 a narrower cockpit. I I don't right. know why. Um, I actually am surprised the seats are good. I have an issue with Ford seats, and right. the seats fine. It's a little short on the cushion. 
I could barely sit behind myself. So I drove it around for a while, parked it, climbed in the back seat. My knees are up against the back. My, but because it has yeah. such an elevated rear seat, you know, you sit up on like a chair. Well, um, and so it, so it eats leg up, support. There, so there's leg support and right. also there's, you know, there's foot room, but there's not leg room in the right. vehicle. Um, right. And it's a little hard to get in and out of the rear. It's definitely so hard to get in and out of the rear. Right. I mean, it's, it's a small vehicle. It's, right. it's made with, you know, a, a, you know, it's the urban family tear around vehicle that, right. that's only two people or one, one, one plus a friend every once in a while, but it's not a long distance car. It's maybe with little, little, little kids. Right. But even then little kids in a booster seat or something are going to have their feet sticking out and they may run out of leg room. Um, so right. it's, it's really, it's a, it's like a jump seat almost, the four-door right. jump seat vehicle. It's fine. I don't think it is going to knock off a CX-3. I think a CX-3 is sportier, more enjoyable, just a nicer feeling vehicle. Um, it reminded me of the tracks. You know, I was yeah. glad you mentioned it because I was like, oh yeah, it's, it's better than the tracks. I, yeah. yeah, I thought it, I thought it wasn't bad. I thought, you know, uh, the transmission occasionally, like I said, a little slow witted, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it has sort of this kind of like old school, like it's, it's up shifting and it's like this, you know, sort of like this weird. <laughs> it dies like, or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was a little strange. But uh, when I, first corner I took it through, you know, cause you're, you, it has the odd ride height, you know, like I said, this, I can't get over this wheel well space. And then you sit up really high in the car. And so when I threw it into the first turn, I'm like, well, this thing is going to be horrible. And it was actually really good. Mm -hmm. uh, like the handling's really quite good. Steering has some feedback, which we don't find in a lot of cars these days. Yeah, yeah you know where the wheels are pointed. And, yeah, and, I yeah. was impressed. But I will say, you know, I thought the ride was probably one of the uh, less great ones in the class, of a mm -hmm. class that is not fantastic. I thought it was pretty choppy and, and jittery until. Yeah, it's a little jittery, uh, but it's it's kind of absorbent. Uh, yeah, but the handling, you're right. I mean, the handling is is, is great. I mean, Ford has and, a lot of no great surprise. handling cars. Uh, right. I yeah. mean, uh, based on the Fiesta, why wouldn't it be? Right. And uh, also the infotainment system, uh, the Ford really good. 3 is really good. I mean, and real knobs, knobs for volume and tuning. Real yep. knobs, nice cluster. You can right. do a lot of things with, with the steering wheel and the cluster. So One uh, last important question about this vehicle. Uh, well, really I want to, but I don't know if we have time for it. But first, automatic emergency braking and forward collision warning are not available on this car at all. How big of a, ge how big of a deal is that, Gabe? Well, that's going to be a, a deterrent, uh, and uh, especially in this class where, you know, some people buy these cars for their kids, and they put some uh, focus on that, and when you have uh, some cars in the class that uh, come with it standard, like uh, the uh, Toyota CHR, for instance, uh, that's... Uh, that's a deterrent. So uh, uh, that just goes to show that, you know, it's not a brand new vehicle. It wasn't okay. designed from the start to have these kind of things. Um, so, um, yeah. And one last question. I'm not trying to ignore you, John, but I'm going to put Gabe on the spot since he's in charge of our car buying program. That's fine. We got, <laughs> you're going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, we got the uh, SES, which is the top level version. Uh, or no, almost one the top before. Level? I mean, there okay. is a titanium above it. And, and so it comes out to $28,000. You know, is that why did we get that, such a high version? So uh, w once you uh, go for the all-wheel drive, uh, they tend to come uh, better equipped and with higher sticker prices than the front-wheel drives. So uh, we were a little shocked that it's twenty-eight thousand yeah. uh, dollars. Yeah. I mean, with yeah. a, a few uh, options like heated seats, uh, sunroof. Um, Thank goodness for the heated seats and steering wheel. I will yeah. say. In this yeah. Um, so at twenty-eight thousand dollars, it's not that far away from a uh, Jeep Renegade sure. or. A, that's comparably equipped, right. uh, but that's uh, the predicament of uh, this the tiny SUV class. I mean, right. you, you get them, uh, they start at like 20,000. It starts, tw at, 20, 20, it starts at 20, so yeah. you can get one at 20, front wheel drive. Right, but yeah. with all wheel okay. drive and some, yeah. some common options, you get it, to like 26, 28,000 dollars, and that bumps into the, uh, uh, the next class right. the of escape, uh, the, you get the escape. compact SUV. Right. Yeah. So it yeah. is what it is, but anyway. Right. Uh, so I think that's gonna wrap it up for this episode. Uh, we want to again remind you, uh, uh, if you want to send in a 30 second video clip uh, with a question or a comment, please do so and uh, maybe we'll put it on the air. Um, if you want to learn more about the cars we talked about on this show, click on the links in the show notes below. As always, uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.